I, I am not a doctor, and, uh, and of course, like I'm, I'm showing like the other side. I'm showing you now a collaboration with the clinical core that comes from a different department and a different set of people. In this case, from me at, at iLabs and the Department of Psychology, and uh, our work and our collaboration is being aimed at finding ways to simplify in uh, many ways this assessment. Make it more precise, though. And we talk about neuropsychology of memory, really, the neuropsychometrics of memory specifically. So uh, I, I think that we've seen enough to show that uh, we're aware that memory loss is a big societal burden. We also know that other cases go undetected. So the clinical core is doing an amazing job in creating these pipelines that get uh, people uh, carefully documented and diagnosed, but still, uh, an enormous amount of cases do not have access to the resources and the professionals that are needed for this. And still a lot of the data uh, across the United States still come from like enormous biased samples. And, and this is kind of like uh, obvious because there are significant bottlenecks in assessment. Sumi has shown like how much time consuming and expertise consuming it can be to have a careful assessment of um, memory and cognitive decline. And in addition to this, the existing tests like the MOCA test or other neuropsychomatical tests are also prone to practice effects. So you cannot really repeat them like, let's say, once a week, once a month to track um, memory decline because people will remember, even if they have uh, episodic memory amnesia and they don't remember things very well, implicit memory still remains, procedural memory still remains, they're going to do better on multiple tests. Uh, interesting enough, and this is where my my team's contribution comes in, uh, we are not aware of any testing tool that is used in clinical settings that is based on models, computational models of long-term memory and episodic memory. But you know, because in 2021, uh, Tom Garbowski and Ryan and I submitted a proposal at the time of the newly funded Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions. And the idea was to combine our two expertises and develop a method to assess uh, episodic memory easily, repeatedly, could be done online, could be done remotely, quickly. And this is actually what I'm going to talk about today. And I hope that this will maybe foster some new collaborations. And I'm happy to answer questions as we go along at the end. The main intuition that we had is that we could create a new tool by combining two different ideas. One is the science, the computational modeling of long-term memory. And the other one is the work that has been done in educational settings, especially by Eric from Ryan, in creating adaptive fat learning systems. So I'm going to walk you through these two components step by step. And I, and I think that as we work through the model and the fat learning system, it's going to be clear how this, this thing works all together. So let's start with the computational model. So uh, there are many sophisticated models, if you want to represent memory, but we started with something that is really a simple model, and a model that has been known in this basic form since the 90s. And it's a model that approximates the decline of memories as a power function. So the odds that you have of remembering something after it has been created at some point in time go down according to power law. So, you know, there is this phenomenon of oscillating forgetting that's very well captured by this equation. And, oh, can you see my pointer on the screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Otherwise, I need to create the, the, the weird laser pointer. Okay. And uh, the, the steepness of this decline can be characterized by a single parameter, the decay rate. This is actually something in psychology is called the power law of forgetting. Uh, this is very simple, right? Because an, an episodic memory in isolation rarely happens. In fact, any single memory that we have of things around us are made of multiple traces that accumulate in the brain over time. So we can create multiple traces. Each of these traces, each of, each of these traces, uh, declines with the same decay rate over time. But the cumulative effect of all these traces creates the fact that the total memory has ups and downs. The probability of retrieving now, measuring them in log odds of retrieval, so we have a nice scale that goes from negative to positive numbers. Uh, go down, then go up again because I get a boost after a second trace is made. Then the memory over time declines, but now it's going to decline a little bit uh, more slowly because there are two traces that are competing for uh, retrieval. And then after a third bump, the memory now it gets uh, a little bit more stable and it's going to slow down. It's going to be less than before. 
Now, this is a good model. There is still something that is missing, and is the fact that so far I've assumed that all the traces decay at the same time. We actually know that this is not true. And in fact, there are a significant amount of effects in psychology, especially the spacing effect, that depend on the fact that not all memories, not all traces are created equal. So we can relax this assumption. Now we have uh, memories that can have a different decay rate. We know that there is a relationship between the decay rate of a memory and the intensity, the freshness, the activation, as we call it, of the existing memory the trace belongs to. And we can modify our equation in this way. So now the decay rate of a particular trace is just the odds that the memory had at the moment, uh, at the, moment the trace was created, plus this parameter phi. We're going to call this the speed of forgetting. Now, this is all the model. And the only thing that we'd like you to remember is the existence of this parameter, the speed of forgetting, and what it means. Because for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk this as the central thing that we're going to measure in every single individual. And the best way to think of it is that the speed of forgetting really captures the persistence of memory almost exactly as envisioned by Salvador Dali in this painting. The idea is that memories are lava. We imagine them as something that is structured and resists over time, but instead they decline spontaneously. The more time passes, the more the memories lose resistance. And the speed of forgetting this parameter captures the initial momentum that memories have when they are created, that has been forgotten. But it's a memory of, uh, it's a measure of memory or liability, if you want, or resistance. Now, I'm going to give you some examples because before attempting to measure this in patients, we've done a significant amount of studies also in, uh, you know, undergraduates and cores that are available at the University of Washington. And we have a good idea of what this number looks like across different people. Let's take, for example, the case of UW undergraduates. So we know that on average, when we measure it, uh, a UW undergraduate has a speed of forgetting of 0 0.29. And because we have a model, we know exactly what this means. I'm going to plot now the trajectory of a memory of a UW undergraduate on this graph. And the graph, because we have a power function, uh, has two log axes. The x-axis is the time that has passed since the memory was first created. And because it's on a log axis, uh, every unit increases 10 times for every single um, block of data. So we, we easily go from one second to one minute, from one minute to one hour. And then if you go ahead, we will see like something expanded to a degree of 60 hours, three days, and so on. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the probability of retrieval, again, on a log axis. So every time you see like uh, a decline in this measure, uh, effectively, the probability is half. So we go from 50% of a few seconds after creating the memory to 0.1% at the bottom. And I'm going to pick a, a, a completely arbitrary threshold. I'm going to tell you exactly how long it takes for a memory with a specific speed of forgetting to cross the 5% threshold. And for your level undergraduates, the result is that after they learn something, the memory is going to have less than 5% probability of being retrieved without any intervention, without being rehearsed. This is just an incidental memory. Eight hours and 31 minutes after the creation. Now, to give you a sense of how this changes with age, I measure my own speed of forgetting. And I've done it multiple times, so I know this is a number that is true and stable. My uh, number is 0 0.33. I'm a 47-year-old white male, and that means that uh, I cross the 5% threshold not eight hours and a half after encoding, but two hours and 43 minutes after encoding. Anybody here is a professor or a teacher is familiar with the effect where you teach something, teach a class in the morning, you mention something, a book, a movie, something related to your class, and then in the afternoon at office hours, students come to you and they ask you, what was the movie? What was the title of the book? And you have no memory of what you said. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? Because undergraduates will still remember or have some trace of the memory eight hours, full eight hours after the class. But by that time, it would have gone. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, among the data I'm going to show you is data that we collected from patients from the clinical core. So we know how the speed of forgetting looks like also in individuals who are in this kind of like early clinical stage who have been diagnosed with my cognitive impairment. And in this case, we know that the average speed of forgetting is 0 
A 0.42 means that you're crossing the 5% threshold this time in less than an hour. In fact, in 20 minutes and 31 seconds. This is a straight prediction of the model, which is kind of like intuitively true, right? Because this is a level at which you have no problem holding up a conversation. You can probably pass a test, but uh, the activities like following a law and order episode the last 45 minutes and at the end, you need to remember something that happened at the beginning of the episode becomes impossible. Because in 20 minutes, most of your memory will have dissipated. Now, among our core, which we follow for one year, we have individuals that have actually developed Alzheimer's disease full blown. And we know that in this case, the, um, the value of the forgetting is 0 0.53. This is the highest values that we ever recorded. Which means that the 5% threshold now is crossed, not in 20 minutes, but in four minutes, less than five minutes. And this is a kind of like a temporal window that is not sufficient not only to follow a TV procedural, but not even to have a normal conversation. And this is the situation where people are familiar with, where having a conversation with a person who has Alzheimer's disease sometimes is frustrating because they don't remember things that you said two conversational tunes before. Well, this makes sense again, given what we know. Now, now that we have this, um, I want to show you how we measure it. And this is the adaptive fact learning uh, system that I mentioned about that we borrowed from something that was developed originally to help students essentially memorize flashcards. And this is the main idea uh, about the adaptive fact learning system. The first question is, when do we want to measure uh, the speed of forgetting? There is a lot of debate in the field of whether you should measure forgetting uh, of episodic memory, like on the course of weeks, on the course of hours. In fact, if we believe into this, if we believe and buy into this model, the answer is surprising. We should measure long-term memory for forgetting at the very beginning. Because most of forgetting, you can see from this axis, 85% of forgetting happens in a very short time, at the very beginning of the time, uh, since the time the memory has been formed. In fact, most of forgetting happens in the first 10 minutes. We can measure best. Uh, the parameter when we focus on things that happen on the order of like what you would do in a very quick assessment on the test. And we, to do this, we create new materials, technically speaking, psychologists call it new pair associates. And there are pairs of images and words or uh, words and words that participants are asked to remember and they are tested a few minutes after. And, and this is how the procedure works. So the adaptive learning system will present you, for for instance, with an image and a name. In this case, this is my favorite example. I'm Italian, sorry, this is Fettuccina. Uh, I create this memory, and then because I have a model, I can predict exactly the moment at which uh, this particular association of an image with a word will be forgotten. Now, this value corresponding to a log out of zero is the point at which a memory is 50%, has a 50% probability of being remembered and a 50% chance of being forgotten. So we call this the forget, forget the uh, retrieval threshold, the forgotten threshold. So I can test then a person exactly at this moment, at the moment in which my mother predicts, well, this is like the psychometric threshold of 50%. And I can present a, a, the image again and ask them to remember what is the name. There are two possible scenarios at this point. Either the person remembers, yeah, I was Fettuccine, congratulations. In which case I can revise the expected value of the five parameters with the forgetting main model and reduce it because effectively this person is forgetting less than I expect. And then I can, after having bumped down the speed of forgetting, I can calculate what's the new best interval to test and wait until this time to test again the person on Fettuccina. Or alternatively, the person could have forgotten already what is the name of this type of pasta. Uh, if this is the case, I can bump up the speed of forgetting. It means that this person is remembering worse than expected. And I can create a new timeline in which I predict that this fat now is going to be forgotten at this time. And I'm going to test again the person uh, at this moment in time and see if they remember what is the name of this type of pasta. I keep doing this. And effectively, what I'm doing, I'm recalibrating the model and this parameter until I get uh, the participant's performance right uh, most of the time. We call this like the creation of the digital twin of the patient. In fact, we're actually collecting data about the response time. We're creating a, a, a tiny model of how a person interacts with the system. 
this is actually how the interface works and you can see like it's working we have a domain uh, for this app on the adrc and it's it, it exists as a phone app so you can actually use it and uh, test everybody who has a, a smartphone available this is how it works so uh this is the Puccina. this is the testing interface uh, we alternate between introducing items, uh, testing the items, and introducing new items, so people are constantly engaged. Uh, and this makes the assessment procedure uh, very fast. In fact, we have found out that China can get good, reliable assessments with just eight minutes. In fact, since our patients are sometimes a bit fidgety and not super, super agile using technology, we have even shortened this to six minutes. And the task is easy. We don't need people to fail 50%. In fact, uh, we have ways to reduce the amount of testing that is needed and make sure that people get most of the items correct. Even our patients, uh, of course, like most of our undergraduates have a 90, 99% uh, level of accuracy, but even our patients with mild cognitive impairment of a, uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, report that the test is easy and they have an average of 85% accuracy. So once we've designed the system, we actually went to the clinical core and we asked to test it out in an experiment on a subset of people. And this actually was work that was mostly done by my graduate student, Holly A, who is responsible for this, and has been collecting this data for like almost two years now. Uh, over the course of like several months, we have recruited 22 amnesic, uh, amnestic MCIs and 29 age match controls, and all of them on a rolling basis, engage in the study where they were assessed weekly with the app for 12 months. So every week that we get a reminder, please follow this link, do this test. And people comply surprisingly well. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I know, sorry, I haven't mentioned, assuming mentioned before, the clinical core has an incredibly, for lack of a better word, badass evaluation protocol where a number of incredible measures are taken and as a result of this we have very reliable uh, clinical diagnosis. Uh, we have also like a bunch of other things and not going to get into all, all these other measures now they relate to our measure. But let me show you a little bit about our samples uh, right now and their demographics. This is a distribution of age. So in general uh, our healthy controls and MCIs are not different in terms of age distribution. Um, thanks to Teresa King, we're able to recruit a very balanced uh, set of groups. Uh, although most of our uh, MCIs were originally recruited to be uh, amnestic MCIs in a single domain, uh, some of them were reassessed in the course of the uh, 12 months in which we followed them, and we're giving a different diagnosis. So of our 22 patients, 11, we're still assessed at the end of the study as having amnestic MCI, uh, sorry, six in a single domain. 11 have progressed to having MCI in multiple domains. Uh, one surprisingly was uh, diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, one was reclassified as having non amnestic MCI, and one had progressed to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Well, what did these patients do for one year? They got a bunch of uh, tests. We call them lessons because effectively people are memorizing new facts. And this is something the patients really enjoy. And sometimes the patients take the lesson, from the test multiple times over the course of a week because they really want to learn about different materials. And we created a variety of lessons um, that were, you know, trying to cater to a variety of different interests. So we have things about classic art, science and technology, history, facts, geography, nature and wildlife, uh, wildlife. Uh, the two best-selling lessons that we had were actually local birds of the Pacific Northwest and local flowers where people kept taking these lessons over and over. Uh, they also did also uh, uh, this uh, kind of like a, an in-person session where people had not to select the answer, but actually test verbally the answer. This was just to make sure that we are not having big effects of recognition versus recall. Uh, and they did that one support. All right, uh, I'm gonna show you now some results of what we got. And I imagine you have a lot of questions about this, this assessment. But the first and most important question that we had, probably you have as well, is whether our measure, the speed of forgetting, this parameter we get from the moment, is a reliable measure or not. And probably the easiest way to measure this is by showing the correlation that we get uh, between all these lessons 
every thing. A good measure should roughly be the same across all lessons, should depend on the material, right? And this is what we found. In general, the tester test reliability of our measure is on average 0.71, uh, which is surprising, especially given the variety of materials that we have brought into this. Uh, you can see that some materials are more reliable than others, but in general, they do not affect too much the reliability of our assessment. Now, some of you might have noticed that uh, I kind of saw a steep sure sneak in the fact that some of the stimuli that we use are visuals, they are images, some of them are words, for instance, dates or names of famous people. Is there a difference in reliability between uh, pictures, images, and words? And it turns out there is no. Uh, textual and visual materials have uh, almost exactly the same reliability. You can see there is no significant difference. But no. The other important question we're asking, is the SOF something that really captures the difference in memory function that happens with my cognitive impairment? Uh, we can do this in different ways. I'm gonna show you the data and I'm gonna try to convince you it doesn't really matter. First, we can just get all the data. We have over uh, 1,500 different sessions from these individuals. And uh, you can see that if we pull them together, the distribution of the values that we get from healthy controls in gold and MCIs in purple are very well separated. We can also average and get a single number for every individual averaging across all lessons. And you can see that the two distributions are very much uh, similar. In fact, they have the same means. They are just a little bit more narrow now because the estimates are, are more precise. And again, these differences are significant. Uh, healthy controls have an average of um, a bit of forgetting of 0.37, while MCIs, as I mentioned before, have an average of 0.42, and this is a, a very reliable significant difference. Um, the third thing that I mentioned before was the practice effects. One of the reasons why I wanted to devise this technique is that because we can plug in like materials uh, that are different every week, uh, we shouldn't find practice effects. And in fact, if we test people, we should them we should not see the SOF values go down over time. That will be a practice effect. In fact, they should be stable, or in the case of MCIs, we should expect them to increase because their memory will keep getting worse. And this is what we found. Uh, this is a sample of uh, 38 weeks. This is the horizon of which we have uh, data for all 52 participants. Uh, some participants are still uh, finishing up the test this year. And you can see that uh, there is clearly not a practice effect. The values are either stable for the controls or increasing for the MCIs. And we actually tested this. We, we created this um, super complete uh, mixed linear model where uh, we had a main effect of weakened group, but also we included intercepts and random slopes that include age, sex, the specific type of lesson that people were doing. And what we found out is that um, the model as an incredible good fit to the data. We found significant effects of age with respect to sex and group. Um, uh, Sumi also mentioned this interesting effect where females tend to divorce. Uh, but we found no effect of weak. In fact, if there is an effect of weak, it's a group by weak interaction that is just marginally significant. MCIs tend to get worse faster than controls. Now, at this point, you might be uh, kind of tempted to ask, the bigger question. So if we could use only one test, and this test was our app, these eight minutes that people can do online to make a diagnosis, how likely are we to be good, to make a diagnosis that is reasonably accurate? Well, this is actually a question that has two parts of an answer. The first is to see where there is a the correlation between diagnosis, the probability of being diagnosed with MCI and the SOF value. And to do this, we actually just divided all the sessions by the um, SOF value that we got. We bin them into tiny, tiny bins. And we calculated the probability that this uh, specific number of uh, SOF that we got for a particular interval would come from an MCI patient or not. And you can see that as the speed of forgetting increases, the probability that this particular value was generated by a patient versus uh, healthy control increases. And it follows, as we would expect in any kind of biological data, a logistic curve. In fact, when we actually try to model the logistic curve, we found out that the model explains like 36% um, of the variance, and the effect is highly significant. 
Of course, this doesn't mean that this is a diagnostic tool. It just means that there is a correlation between this value and uh, a diagnostic uh, outcome. But what if we actually were to use this as a as a as a you know assessment tool? Well, we can calculate uh, the specificity and sensitivity of our measure by selecting a threshold and checking uh, what is the specificity and sensitivity that in classifying, doing a binary classification of people based on this particular threshold. As we slide the threshold for SOS up and down, we can see, of course, the sensitivity and specificity changes, and we can plot this curve. These are what we call uh, ROC curves, and the area under the curve is a measure of the accuracy of a classifier. Uh, we have so much data, of course. We have multiple sessions for participants, so we ask the question for like the first session the participants took, what is the accuracy? For the second session, and we average the first and second together, and we went on up to the 10th session that the participant did with us. And here are the 10 ROC curves. You can see that the first one is pretty good, but then they, get, uh, they quickly tend to get better and cover a larger area. And here are the corresponding uh, areas for the number of quantitative assessment. So you can see that with the first session, we are accurate 85% of the time. We have an accuracy of 0.85, which means that we can tell apart MCIs from non-MCIs uh, with this level of accuracy. But if we average the first two sessions, our accuracy gets to 88. And then if we get to the third session, well, it pretty much doesn't change after that. We get to an accuracy of 92. Um, we can push it to 94%, but the difference is not significant at that point. How does that compare? So uh, as we have seen, there is this amount of data that goes into a clinical evaluation. It's really an art form and requires an enormous level of expertise. But as Sumi said, if you were to do something quick and dirty in the clinical field, you will use the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which still requires an an hour of test done by um, an expert professional. So uh, suppose I were to pitch our eight minute app against the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. How would I, you know, like how, how comparable would it be the results? Well, remarkably comparable. And in fact, you can see that the, uh, the MOCA test has an accuracy of 94%. It's not perfect because people can have a bad day uh, because our doctors uh, get a holistic view of a patient that includes not only the MOCA score that they got in a particular day, but also uh, family history, observation, and so on. So the MOCA per se is not a perfect indicator. And, and neither is our SOF, but you can see that they are very comparable in terms of accuracy and diagnostic um, ability. All right. So this is actually the last slide that contains data I want to show you. And I'm going to do like a quick summary. And I hope that this uh, presentation has been able to convince you that using a model-based assessment, we can actually quantify with a single quantity an important characteristic of episodic memory, the tendency to be forgotten. Um, we also have seen that, much to our surprise, we can use this to detect changes in memory in MCI and ND. And to a certain extent, this is not going to replace any clinical assessment, I assume, but it has a diagnostic criteria. So what is next? Well, these two years of work have pushed us in many different directions, and there are many different ways in which we'd like to proceed. We currently have like some interesting ideas that we're working to. The first is that, of course, people in the clinical core, patients in the clinical core, not only have done this test, but as part of the evaluation, they've also um, had a number of bio, uh, biomarkers, blood and CSS cells were taken. And of course, there is a processing queue. We are still waiting for the results, but for about a dozen of them, we have some results. And it, it, it seems that the, the, you know, for instance, like the density of amyloid that we can get in the CSF samples does seem to correlate a negative with the speed of forgetting. So more amyloid, positive with the speed of forgetting. Uh, more amyloid, more speed of forgetting, which is interesting. Of course, we're waiting for more results. Some of these patients are also involved in the imaging studies. There is an imaging core as well. and might have MRI and PET scans. And will be really interested in going back and actually analyzing this data once we have it. Uh, together with Mike Rosenblum, we also try to use um, this model-based assessment to test uh, a new approach to um, kind of like treating disease. The idea is to 
use neurostimulation TMS to boost back uh, the default mode network, which is disrupted in uh, AD and MCI. And this disruption seems to underline to be correlated with some of the memory symptoms and see if we can actually get uh, a small uh, boost in memory function after extensive TMS uh, application. The idea is that our measure, the speed of forgetting, is more sensitive than a normal memory questionnaire, and we can detect effects that otherwise would require an enormous amount of uh, patience to get sufficient power. Now, one of the other directions in which we decided to go is also test for like a wider um, age range. So you think that my affiliation is that also not only in psychology, but also the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, uh, the ILAP uh, is really focused on early childhood because, you know, this is actually where the brain develops and where fundamental cognitive functions, like including memory, are set. And so we decided to test uh, whether our system would work with children. Uh, thanks to Anais Kapik, a uh, student working in my lab and also collaborating with my crossover right now, we develop a version that is child friendly. There are only images, there are images that are recognizable, and children are really eager to do this. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is probably you don't have an interest in child data, but this means that we have a version that is absolutely non verbal and can be done, for instance, in people or uh, can be used to test memory in individuals who don't speak English or come to communities and have some. Uh, pathology like progressive aphasia, where using verbal material would be completely impossible. And if we can do it in children, we can do it in these patients as well. In fact, after running a study with children, we were able to get estimates uh, of uh, the speed of forgetting that pretty much followed the entire lifespan. So you can see the children have a really bad memory. They're almost comparable to our MCIs. And their memory reaches a peak function uh, right before the 20s. Then it starts slowly declining. And of course, in MCIs, you start seeing the separation past 60 years old, where individuals um, uh, start showing like an increased forgetting that is beyond the normal declining curve. Our idea would be like, what if we could push this back, the separation back to the 50s, and use this to see changes before they are normally detected by uh, traditional assessment tools? And we could predict a 50 where memory would be in the 60s and 70s. This is like the direction where we're trying to go with this kind of like longitudinal assessments of memory during the lifetime. And of course, our ultimate goal was to use this for large scale assessment because uh, with all these limitations, this tool is really easy to use and it's really inexpensive. We can put this on a smartphone and we can give it to like thousands of people at the same time. And the app really does all the evaluation per se. We'll just be able to give you back data that you can use then to call people back and so on. And we think that this would be like a great way to reach to underrepresented population. That day I was really interested in the outreach efforts that were done at the clinical core. Because these are population that tend to be, uh, besides being difficult to reach, they tend also to be a little bit skeptical and they typically don't go to doctor or to medical professionals by themselves. And because of this, we are trying to plan uh, with a couple of community organizations a population health proposal where this app will be given together with a, a smartphone to, we hope, at least like a few hundred individuals and we have an opportunity to follow them uh, for a long amount of time. And eventually, if the, if the app detects something abnormal, maybe refer them to the primary care physicians. That's it. Uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Headache and Martin from Memory Lab, the company that developed educational software. Tom, of course, um, at the ADRC. My students, Holly, Anais, and Bridget, and the incredible Theresa King, who has been helping us in this kind of painful recruiting project, uh, uh, effort for this project. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. So are there questions out there? I have one I'll ask while people are thinking about it. I have many, but um, just starting backwards. So um, awesome. When you think about this, um, you know, if we were to use these, so you'd shown how your, your, 
you know, your peak gets more narrow if you do it a couple of times just to get more accurate mm -hmm. measures. So um, do you imagine that you would, um, would people do this for a couple of times over a few weeks and that would be their one measure for the year of 2024? Or, you know, how, how many times would they do it over how long of a period? So um, my, my idea, my intuition is that uh, we wouldn't ask people to do it uh, multiple times in every condition. So if you get a value that is very high, we don't really care uh, for you to repeat the test because we know that very likely you are going to be diagnosed with an MCI. If you get a value that is very low, same thing. But we think that uh, repeated tests could be used strategically for individuals that are like on the cusp, like people mm -hmm. who have a value of like 0 0.39. Well, is it 0 0.38 or is it 0 0.41? Let, let's do the test one more time. Yeah. And in fact, we don't actually need to do the test because one of the things that we're working on right now from a technical point of view is our self-terminating software. Right now, we have a time limit. It's, it used to be eight minutes, so we shortened it to six. But there is no reason for the test to have a fixed point for everybody. It could just keep going until we get a good estimate and decide that, okay, if we're here, let's do the test like a couple of minutes longer. So go ahead. Oh, um, if I could ask a question, um, I've yeah, heard of you. Good to see oh, you. No. Yeah. Great to see you and great talk. Um, I'm really curious also about just the stimuli that are used to, we've talked about this before, just familiarity um, versus relative uniqueness of certain items. Um, I guess I'm wondering too, if one possible future direction is using pictures or just different types of stimuli that don't tax language as much? Yes. So that was the motivation for, that was actually one of the motivations behind the child study. It was to, uh, you, you can consider children as, you know, um, no, they are not quite proxies for individuals with aphasia, but they don't have language abilities and their processing speed or capacity is limited. So we told that if we can work out the kinks of developing such a system with five-year-olds, because this is the, the population that we use, uh, we would have something that could deploy it. And we actually learned a lot. We learned a lot about the problems of like image complexity. You cannot have like things that are um, too complicated. For Even for elderly adults with MCI, we could use stimuli like flowers. Now, flowers are geometrically complicated. If we use it with children, because if they are not that interested, they, 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 they confuse them all the time. That's the reason we created this kind of like funny characters uh, that look like cartoonish and 3D. Um, so th that's exactly the direction where we are moving, like trying to figure out what are the, uh, the, the best stimuli that we can use so that we can have like, not quite a universal set, but at least like something that could be used more, uh, more specifically and with better results. The other project, uh, is a project where we turn to use some kind of like modeling techniques to recover um, prior knowledge, familiarity with an item. So of course, even when we're doing when we're doing the birth lesson, some people knew exactly what a dark eye junko is. The dark eye junko uh, stuck with me because I didn't know what it was, but a lot of our elderly knew exactly what it was. They've probably been feeding junkos uh, for the past ten years. It, it, it was clear that this item was known because uh, we actually estimate the speed of forgetting for every item now. And this item was like better remembered than anything else. So if we can identify this, like, okay, we, okay, you got, we got this. Now we can replace it with something else that you might not know. Again, this is like an online optimization that we are thinking about. Cool. So I had a kind of a question, a follow up for you, Andrea, that uh, started with the uh, Sumi, and that is, you know, this whole concept of a retrospective study to get uh, kind of a, a clinical phenotype, you know, cognitive dysfunction readout relative to the complex neuropathology of the disease. How long do you think it'll be before uh, some of your test subjects, you know, are at the terminal end of being studied. They have an aut brain autopsy and, you know, we've got a complete clinical picture and all that. And you can go back and start to piece together the relationship between what end stage looked like and what, you know, how the 
cognitive dysfunction unfolded over time? That is a, a, a wonderful question. And it's something that I've been like thinking about a lot because um, the, the ultimate uh, diagnostic criteria would be, would be being able to tell now a person that 10 years, 20 years down the line, your brain is going to look corrupted like this. You, you might have amyloid plaques everywhere. Um, but of course, this is an extreme longitudinal study. And we cannot use the app on people who have already died, and we cannot start recording now with the prospect of right. um, collecting this data. And, and I thought it was, a, a, you know, just impossible to do. Uh, but apparently, people like yourself um, think in these extremely long terms. Yes. Yeah, and I wasn't aware of something I saw a presentation by Jason Webster at IBIC, uh, that was trying to use this kind of like imaging results and then right. autopsy results collected years later. And like, okay, that would be really an exciting direction if it could be done. I think the, the tricky part of those sorts of studies is to uh, figure out a way to make sure the data that you collect today and the data you collect 10 years from now are interoperable because, you know, as you go along, people always figure out new ways to improve things, but that, you know, kind of necessitates changing from what you used to do, which makes it hard to compare the data. So um, I think that's the art of, you know, building things for the long term. Of course, with, you know, the longest term thinking we tend to do being NIH funding for five years, it's a little hard to think longer than that. Obviously, this is a much longer than five year sort of problem, right? Yeah, um, but uh, this is really not not my territory, but uh, if you yeah, are interested easy. in any way, or if you have any ideas on how this could be done, I, I would be like, of course, like super interested in collaborating. Because this is the ultimate ground truth, right? It, it's, it's not like these indirect measures. We have the right. uh, absolute like ground truth of the brain, and then we have, on the other hand, like a measure that is model-based even, right. to the that is down from behavior. So connecting the two would be amazing. Totally agree. And off the top of my head, I have no great ideas, but I think that it's something we should all think about as a field. And maybe somebody on this Zoom will have a brilliant idea tonight and uh, <laughs> change the field. But I, th I think it's a, an important thing to think about. And beautiful talk, by the way. That was really nice. Oh, thank you. Other questions out there? I should not speak so much. Andrea, I have I have a question. Thank you so much Hi, for Katie. sharing this data. Hi, it's nice to see you again. Nice um, to see you too. I really enjoyed this presentation. I was curious about two things. Um, one is when you were thinking about the multiple traces at the very beginning of your talk. Um, were you thinking that this is a a trace of the same memory, as in like a reactivation of that same engram? Or are these other pieces of the engram, like contextual factors or other, like how do, how do these other pieces of memory potentially play into the modeling that you might do? And then secondarily to that, but I, I think you answered this, but I was just curious, since you had people doing these multiple times, did you see any effects you said there wasn't really a learning effect so i assume there's not really an effect of like reconsolidation or anything like that in this particular test which is cool but can you speak to that at all as well yes i, I love both of these questions these are really like uh, amazingly and, and, and theoretically sophisticated so yeah the model as you have noticed is is really simple it has an overly simplified view and we consider uh, we do not distinguish between identical traces uh, of the same exam memory that are being like uh, re you know recalled and because of that experience versus slightly different uh, traces like presentation of the same material but at two different moments in time. Uh, we consider them identical points and we just collapse them. Getting into these small contextual effects would be like one of the ways in which this model could grow and be better and be more reliable. Uh, the price to pay, of course, is that um, I come from uh, the, the field of like neural models, which are more sophisticated than this. But the price to pay is that, of course, the, the, the fit in them is much more complicated. There is a beauty in simplicity that uh, makes it easier to deploy.
Uh, as for your other question about learning, so when I said that there is no no practice effects, I should be more specific and say there are no practice effects um, on uh, different, there are no practice effects like if people get tested uh, across different weeks, they get better and better because somehow they figure out a strategy to do this task. Uh, the materials do change every week, and this is part of the reasons why you don't see practice effects. Um, people do get better at doing the app, and we see this because the response times are getting faster. And even like 40 weeks in, uh, people get much better. And this is just because they get better at interacting with the phone. So people start out uh, and they, they takes them about four seconds to respond. And by the end of the year, they respond in less than two seconds. So this is a massive gain. The, the trick is that we are able, because we are estimating multiple parameters at the same time, to separate motor learning from like memory effects. Uh, one of the questions that I got asked some time ago was whether this could be used, for instance, from people who have extreme motor learning problems, like Parkinson patients. In this case, we expect, we expect the response time sometimes of 10 seconds, and we don't know if actually our model would be robust enough, but it would be cool if it were.